Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. Thank you for joining us again today. We are here today with Chris Benson from Reliant Real Estate Management, which is the 17th largest self-storage operator in the United States. He is the chief investment officer. Reliant now has invested over $400 million in self-storage projects and raised over $200 million in equity uh, from its substantial retail investor network. Chris, thank you for being on the show and welcome. Uh, my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit more about your background um, and how you got to the self-storage industry. Yeah, so for, for me personally, um, I'll, I'll take a step back behind uh, self-storage. I probably similar to to your story and many of the people who are listening here. I remember waking up at 29 and being like, I'm not doing this another 30 years. Uh, I was very fortunate to be a part of some incredible companies. Mike, we were just talking about before we started recording Intuitive Surgical. Um, that was an incredible organization, incredible technology. We had the opportunity to make uh, great money there. And, and really, that was kind of seed capital for me, uh, for my real estate journey. and. Uh, I know it sounds hokey, but my journey started with reading Rich Dad Poor Dad. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and I was like, oh, passive income. That makes much, much more sense. And so that started our journey. And we started probably very similarly to a lot of people. Uh, we had a bunch of residential units in the town that we lived in. We had 22, I think. And I hated it, um, mostly in duplexes and um, and single families and it was just soul sucking, Mike. It was it was not like I wasn't doing like the plumbing and electric like we had that stuff outsourced, but the people problems always seemed to fall back to me, and there were plenty of them. Um, and so I wish I could give credit to who said it, but I read it or heard it, and the the thesis was big deals and small deals are the same amount of work. You just make less money on small deals. And I was like, ah, we got to go bigger. So. Um, long, long story short, a guy I went to church with owned a construction company and I hadn't talked to him in 15 years and called him and said, Hey, I have a little bit of money. I want to build apartments. And that was the beginning. We built a 64 unit apartment complex and that's where the light bulbs went off for me. That's where I was like, Oh, this is how you make money in real estate. So um, we we did that uh, successfully. I still own those apartments. We actually are about to list them for sale. Um, that that's been a, a huge win, a great learning experience. And then um, then I realized what syndications were. I didn't even know that they existed. And I was like, wait a minute, I don't even have to do any of my own work. I can just write a check, and somebody else does all the work, and I just have to pick the right people. And so started investing in syndications, first in multifamily. And then about seven years ago, I was convinced that cap rates in multifamily couldn't get any lower. I was off by, you know, five or six years, but eventually I was right. And um, so I wanted to get another asset class. And for me, it was going to be mobile homes or self-storage. So my story with Reliant kind of getting to the self-storage part is I was an investor first in one of their syndications. And um, Todd Allen, who started Reliant and I just formed a great partnership or great friendship and he wanted to scale. And I had had some experience raising capital in the deals that I had done. And so um, that was the value I kind of brought to the partnership. And that was six years ago. And we've been on a tear ever since. We're, as you said, you know, with the last three years, we've tra transacted over a billion dollars on the buy and sell side with the 17th largest storage operator. and. You know, we continue to grow and I think there's a lot of runway in front of us. So when when I first talked to you guys, I was intrigued by part of your business plan as far as accumulating smaller operations and then packaging and then some of it you sell. And at that point it was kind of like this, oh, seeing this place uh kind of in the in the real estate and private equity markets where 
um, different groups of people in different places are looking to own uh, bigger or smaller or different places. And it, it really opened up my vision to what's possible because everybody's not fighting over the same thing. They're looking to accomplish different things. Can you explain that a little bit of, of how you kind of conglomerate storage facilities and then possibly package them and sell them? Yeah. I mean, Mike, if, I mean, it's called surgeon syndicate. So I would guess that a bunch of people who are listening to you are probably also physicians and no one has seen the a, a private equity roll up more so than physicians in the last 10 years, right? You've seen the huge consolidation where, you know, the big groups like an Optum Health are gobbling up and building these big multi-specialty practices. Um, the same thing happens. The, the easiest way to think about it is institutional capital always finds yield. So they're always looking for something that is going to create cash flow. And that could be real estate. It could be physician practices. And, and the challenge is, as you are big, as you go up the capital stack into institutional money, right? Think endowments, insurance companies, private equity funds. Those guys have to write big boy checks, right? Like they got to write hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of checks because it doesn't move the needle for them as an investment. I'll give you just a quick example. I think CalPERS is one of the biggest teachers' pensions in the country. And they rate, they manage, I don't know, it's like a half a trillion dollars, right? If I went to them today, Mike, and said, give me 25 million, tomorrow I'll give you 50 million. They'd be like, nope, it doesn't, it doesn't even, it's not even a blip on the needle, right? So large institutions have to invest at scale. So groups like us, are a roll-up strategy. We take the mom and pop type of operators, roll them into a larger portfolio, and basically we can produce something that's big enough for those larger institutions to write a check to and make it make sense. And historically, at least up until this point, there's been a premium in the values paid for those larger portfolios as well, because there aren't very many of them to buy. Does that make sense? Yeah, because because it's been a more uh, segmented market. Yeah, the, the statistic we you know about thirty percent of the square of the facilities in the U.S. are owned by publicly traded companies, rough and tough. Um, so there's still a lot of fragmentation in the marketplace, and like you said, we're the seventeenth largest storage operator. We only have ninety three properties, right? In in the pantheon of storage, we're pretty big, but you know, public storage has 2,300, right? It's a whole different level. So, you know, our our role in the space is, and where we think the most runway is, is that consolidation play. Buy those mom and pop operators, position them, position them for an institutional buyer, you know, do our own uh, method of value add to them. And then we we can provide a large portfolio for that transaction. And so when you say mom and pop operation, so are some of those, what are the, what's like the smallest storage facility you'd look at buying and what's like the biggest? So mom and pop necessarily isn't facility size. I would argue people who own less than five facilities, kind of mom and pop. And it, it's not a derogatory term in any way, shape or form, right? It's just, they're not operating at scale. And generally, there's some low-hanging fruit from a management side of things that they're not taking advantage of in those smaller operations. You know, things like U-Haul truck rental, tenant insurance, online marketing spend, right? They, they, they don't have a big budget to spend. Um, you know, the, the other big one is pricing algorithm tools where their pricing changes daily to squeeze as much net operating income as they can out of a property. You know... Mike, if, if your dad built a storage facility 30 years ago, he's not doing that today, right? He, he's just running it. He's collecting checks. And basically what's happening is he's aging out and you're saying, dad, I don't want to run this thing. And so they're selling it to groups like us and making a fortune, right? Your dad built it for a million bucks and we're buying it for 15. <laughs> so, so he's a, happy. It's a good deal for everybody. Yeah. It, and so I think it's just part of the season of an asset class. And Mike, this has happened in every real estate asset class. They all consolidate. And 10 years from now, the big will be bigger in self-storage. 
and this opportunity will not exist forever. So there won't the the small and, and so when you when you see self storage facilities, some of them you drive by and it might be just twenty units, sure, like a, a big garage, but other ones are are substantially built bigger multiple buildings. So even with those, if it's one facility, but maybe it has uh, a couple hundred units, that's still considered a, a small facility. And a mom and pop operation, and maybe they own three or four facilities that size is still small scale and something that you're looking to purchase and consolidate. Yeah. And, and you asked a question that I didn't answer, which is what are the sizes we look at? Typically, because of our overhead, when we plug our management platform in, it's got to be big enough to manage our overhead because we have significant overhead. And so typically, we're not looking at anything below 50,000 square feet, net rentable square feet, um, unless it has a pretty substantial expansion opportunity where we can go in and build more square footage. So there are some situations where I'll give you an example. In our current fund, um, there's a deal that we're basically doubling the square footage at the facility, right? We're buying just about 30,000 square feet and we're building about 30,000 square feet. And that's our value add. But but generally, we're not looking at stuff smaller than that to run on its own. Now, it, this is another model that we're toying around with, which is like hub and spoke, where you mentioned those little small facilities, right? Well, if we own a facility in the market that's manned, right, we have management staff there, buying those little ones around it that our team can manage is a way to do value add or add square footage without the construction risk. So we've done that in some markets too, depending on you know what our footprint looks like. But think of it like a hub and spoke. You know, you got the hub in the middle, and then you may have these little facilities all the way around it, and it gives you an opportunity to to grow the scale in that marketplace. So that little facility alone, you're big enough; it's not worth the 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 time to own it or the cost to, to run it from your platform. But if it's just adding to to management you already have in place in that city, it doesn't add cost to you, it just adds more units. You got it. Yeah, we can run it with basically a very minimal cost structure. Okay. And so now with the, uh, so with the fund, the fund now gives people an opportunity to invest passively, but they put money in the fund and, and then your payments come back out. What type of a, a timeline do you offer to investors as far as uh, when they put their money? And I know sometimes if you're looking at new construction or apartment buildings or a big value add play, you put your money in and then you don't see any payments for the first year or two. And then you start seeing uh, what's the timeline with investing with Reliant? Yeah, we, we generally, Mike, project a six year hold like the fund that that we are uh, we have open today is it's a projected six year hold. Historically, everything that we've taken full cycle for investors has been just about three and a half years. But that's been a function of the market, right? The last 10 years in real estate have basically just done this. You know, and if if you haven't made money in the last 10 years in real estate, you should probably be in a different business at this point. Um, so because the market is shifted, you know, when when money is free or pretty close to free, it's it's pretty easy to make money um, and, and the market shifted. So um, I would argue that although historically, everything that our investors have received a full cycle investment on has been three and a half, if I had to bet money today, I would bet that our hold period is probably going to be longer than that um, based on where we are in the cycle. So you know, a thing to think about, Mike, and this is true of, of Reliant or pretty much any other syndication you're looking at, you know, it's Think of it like a mutual fund of self-storage properties. We go out and raise a bunch of money and we try to buy as many properties as we can and diversify your risk across them. Um, but it's illiquid. And as investors, most syndications are set up that way where you have to be comfortable that there is no end date. Theoretically, we could hold your money forever. Now, the, the compensation structure is set up where we won't make any money if we do that. So there's not really an incentive for us to do it. But what you don't want as an investor is us to be forced to sell because there are some funds that have time limits and especially institutionally where, you know, they may have a, a six year fund with two one year extensions. Well, if you get to the second one year extension, 
the fund has to sell regardless of market conditions. So even if you're in a downturn, they may have to fire sale assets because the fund life is over. So what we try to do is we want people to be understand that, look, we want enough time to make sure we can build the value. And then you as an investor just have to be comfortable that it is illiquid. You know, you can't come to us and say, hey, I need my cash back. We say, I'm, I'm sorry, there is, it's not there anymore. You own part of that property. Okay. Well, and and because some of our listeners being a newer show are people who are kind of new to the real estate space. So I guess part of that question was also, do you make distributions or payments where there, there's some return on the equity during the investment? Yeah, we, we do distributions on a quarterly basis. Um, every, every deal is a little bit different, right? As, as you evaluate deals, some people do it monthly. And depending on the structure, if it's a ground up development deal, you may not have any distributions for two years. Yeah, our fund generally is distributing right away. So um, we just made our first distribution in the fund last quarter, and we should be doing it every 90 days after that, as, assuming the properties continue to perform well. Okay. And, and for the people who are newer, when you say that when you end the fund, so that's the situation where as the fund is growing, you're bringing in money and you're buying properties. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, those properties generate some cash and some of that cash gets distributed. And then at the end of the fund is then when you take that whole group of properties and sell them up the equity ladder to a, to a bigger equity group. Potentially. It, or, Mike, it could be a scenario where you sell an individual deal in the fund, right? So we're on our fourth fund. Um, we're in the midst of, uh, it's targeted to be a $100 million raise. We have eight properties closed in it. The ninth will close in October. Um, we don't have to sell all of them, right? Let's say we end up with 12 properties in the fund. We can sell a specific deal, one, or potentially all 12, or if that's what we end up with. So we have the flexibility as the operator basically to sell when it makes the most sense for you and us as the investor. The thing, Mike, for your listeners too, is what you want to make sure of if, as you look at any deal is that your incentives are aligned with the operator, right? You, you don't want the operator to make money without you making money and vice versa. You want us to make money when you make money. And so I think that's a big thing is people learn what syndications and how those structures look. It's understanding, well, what is our incentive as the operator and making sure that that aligns with what you as the, as the um, investor want as well. So what are some of the different things since we, we go down to the, we've, got, we've gone down this road of the motivations, um, which might be a difference between one syndicator and another that that investors should be aware of. And, and I guess from the investor standpoint, um, if you're looking for either, you know, monthly payouts because this now may be money you're living on, or if you're a doctor and you're still working and this is more building, you know, equity towards retirement, are there any other considerations and in, in aligning your interests with, you know, between investor and operator? Sure. I, I think what you just described, right, is understanding what you need your capital to do, right? So there are, think of it, I, at least me personally, I think of it as sleeves of capital, right? I have an appreciation sleeve, I have a preservation sleeve, and I have a cash flow sleeve, right? And there are different opportunities that fit in those buckets. Reliant is not a great cash flow play, especially in today's environment, right? You can go get a US Treasury for 5%, I would argue, you know, probably not a great long-term strategy, but short-term, you can park your money somewhere and, and earn something on it. And so, but Reliant historically has been a good appreciation play. So if you have capital where you're like, hey, you know, long-term, I need to appreciate, that makes sense. So I think the first thing as an investor is understanding what is the goal of the capital and then trying to find a vehicle that helps you do that. To your point on how do we align incentives, Think of deals, when you look at the structure of deals, there's two ways we as the operators get paid. Fees, fee structure in the deal, and, and you should pay fees. If you have quality human beings working at, at the team, they need to get paid and the fees are what cover overhead, right? So you just got to make sure that the fee structure is not 
uh, off market, right? Like it should be in the range that everybody's deals basically are in. Um, so fees take that off. The the part the reason we're in the business is for the promote structure at the end, where profits get split between you, the investor, and us, the sponsor. That's why we do what we do. We we get rich when you get rich. And what you want to make sure of in the structure is like, I'll give you our example, and I'm not saying it's a perfect scenario, but when we have a capital event, we have a preferred return that is accruing for each year that we have your money. So you're earning this preferred return. And in our case, it's a 9% annualized preferred return. So it's like a loan, right? For every year we use your money, we're going to hold this 9% for you. When we have a capital event, a sale or a refinance, we first have to return 100% of your principal. So whatever you originally invested, then that 9% a year, we catch it up to whatever we owe you. So now in your pocket, you have all your money back and you have a 9% a year annualized. If there's any money left over, that's what we get to share in. That's called the promote or water. You know, Some people call it a waterfall or a promote. That's what we make our money on. And, and in that scenario with us, you have all your money back and a 9% annualized return before we get to share in the profits. And what we're trying to incentivize is, look, we do not make any upside until you got a decent return, right? Like most people, if they got 9% on their money, they'd be like, oh, that's not bad. So the goal is to give you that, and then we share in the upside with you. So it's just understanding how this operator gets paid. And in some scenarios, Mike, I've seen lots of deals where we we may get paid before you get all your money back. That always gives me a little bit of anxiety. I, I want to make sure the investors have their cash back before we share in the profit structure. Well, wow, that's a nice uh, yeah way to look at it for for aligning the interests again. And so basically, when we look at the fees, the fees are 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 paying the salaries of the people who are working in the business, essentially, because everybody's got to buy groceries and pay mortgages or rent and all the things that everybody goes to work for. Sure. And but then on top of that is once the the expenses are paid and everybody gets a paycheck. And then when the when the money's coming back out, the investor gets all their original investment back plus their nine percent or their preferred return. And then where everybody does well is where you start to split that money to where the operator gets a reward for doing a really good job and having that money left over. And the investor gets the reward for investing with a good operator and they share those profits. You got it. Um, what are some of your biggest concerns if if you're investing passive when we talked about that that you you know you invested in deals passively too? What are the biggest red flags that make you say, nope, I'm running away, not gonna touch that? Oh man, there's we could have a whole podcast just about that. <laughs> um, you know, look, what you have to understand about real estate syndications and and these private placements is ultimately you're investing in people. Right, Mike, when you write a check to Reliant or any other sponsor, you're betting that the people on their team can execute on a business plan. If they are bad people, it doesn't matter what they're investing in. Right. I, I'm sure you've seen the headlines about CrowdStreet, you know, that group Nightingale misappropriated $68 million. CrowdStreet's due diligence is incredibly good. I know the CIO, right? Like I know what those sponsors do. This group had a 20 plus year track record. Right, these guys were not fly by night operation, and they they took sixty eight million from investors and said we're going to buy properties, and they never bought them. That's a problem, right? Well, no matter what due diligence you do as an investor, if I'm a bad person, we're going to take your money. So the first thing I always think about, and this is with my own personal investing, and I would encourage everybody who looks at any deal, do your homework on the people first background checks, Google searches. It's amazing what you'll find if you just search someone on Google, right? It, it doesn't have to be hard. A background check's inexpensive. And if you're sin or if the operator is pushing back on those things at all, run, 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 right? If they're like, no, we won't do that. Great. I'm never giving you any of my money. So I think, you know, first, I, I always think about team first. 
And then the second thing I think about personally and what we preach to our investors is track record. What I'm pitching to you, show me you've done it before for a long time and preferably through a couple cycles. Right? Team, track record. Now, not everybody has a track record, right? People start, you know, there, there are people early in their career. And I'm not saying those are bad bets, but it's a different risk profile. And you as an investor should be rewarded for that risk. Reliant, we've taken uh, 64 deals full cycle. We've never lost investor principal. Now, I'm not saying we never are going to, but we got a, a really strong track record over 10 plus years. Well, that's different than the guy who's maybe been in business three years and has had three things go full cycle. I'm not saying that that guy's not a great investment, but you as an investor should be compensated for that risk, which means you should earn a higher promote or a better structure if they do well, because there's a much better chance that they won't do well. And, and the same holds true for us, Mike. You can buy a share of public storage, which well, used to be is right now the number two publicly traded self-storage REIT in the country. You can go buy a share on New York Stock Exchange, right? Well, they are a much better risk than us. They have 2,300 properties. Their balance sheet is probably safer than the U.S. government. It is safer than the U.S. government, right? They have 30% LTV across, I don't know exactly, but hundreds of billions of dollars of storage. We have 93 properties. We're a small company in Roswell, Georgia. So if you invest with us versus public, you should get paid more. There's a risk premium for investing in us. So that's just something I always think about as team and track record. And where am I on the risk spectrum? If I'm risky and I like the team and I like the track record, well, then I'm going to get paid more or I'm not going to do it because I don't need to, if I'm getting paid the same, I don't need to take that risk. I can go get that from somebody who's more established. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's a great way of looking at it. And where so typically if a deal's being pitched and the returns are amazing, there's some risk in there somewhere. Well, let, let or the, me there's typically more box. maybe more risk in there. Not always. Um, but I, I guess that's a question. If if it looks like a really good deal and there's supposedly no risk, is it maybe a red flag to say Try and figure out why, at least. Maybe it's not a bad deal, but but why? Most, nothing has no risk, right? Even yes. buying the U.S. Treasury today, the government is a giant Ponzi scheme, right? <laughs> so if you believe in the, the viability of the U.S. government, I guess you could say it's no risk. But if you know how the government is paying you, it's a Ponzi scheme. So... Everything has risk. What I would what I would say is don't make bets based on return projections. They're all made up. It's all an Excel spreadsheet. And all we're doing is plugging in assumptions. And, and we don't know, Mike, and I'm, I'm speaking of this, of our deals and everybody else's. We're projecting six years from now what we think is going to happen in the world, right? Well, that's impossible. We've been wrong, and I told you we have this really good track record, right? We've been wrong in every one of those instances. We just happen to have been wrong in the right way, right? We underestimated and the market overperformed. So we, you know, investors crush it and people think you're really smart. It's not true. You're, you're making an assumption that hopefully the market follows along. But, you know, think back six years ago, would anybody have predicted that office is going to fall off the face of the earth? I wouldn't have. Right? If you had said to me six years ago, Chris, should I invest in office? I'd be like, yes, you know, bedrock. Like, and then <laughs> COVID happens. And now it's, it's the pariah of real estate. So you just, I, I would really caution people to not think about this as, well, this one has a better projected return for than this one. So this must be a better deal. It, it's all made up. It's okay. All Excel spreadsheet. So that was coming at it from the, the opposite direction. So the way you explained it was if you look at two groups and one group has less experience, that is some increased risk. Sure. And so they should give you, if the projects look exactly the same, the one with less experience should be giving you a better return 
because that's part of your risk of going with them. Agreed. Uh, okay. Awesome. Mike, I'm going to equate it back to your world. You're a urologist. How many prostatectomies have you done in your career? Uh, several hundred. I should have that number exactly, but I don't. <laughs> All right. So let's say 500. You've done 500 prostatectomies. I'm fresh out of fellowship and I've done five. Which one is a riskier proposition? If I'm getting my prostate out, I'm probably going to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great analogy. And one of my mentors in training who I trained with at that time, I think he'd done 1,800. And he even said, he goes, ah, the, the first 500 I did were trash. I'm like, the first 500? But it's true because the consistency of the product he produced was insane because he'd done it so many times and seen all the variables, all the things that could happen, um, that there were no surprises and he could react to those changes. So I guess that's kind of the same. If you look at an operator and they've been through the process a lot of times, they've seen all those things you never would have expected. And so when they happen, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. We're going to adapt. We're going to find a solution. We're going to fix and it doesn't get rid of all the risk, but it gives them a much better chance of not having things go sideways. And so there's yeah. a little, maybe some less risk there because they're going to be better attuned to, to dealing with problems that always happen. And I think this, this kind of funnels into the conversation of why be, people become passive investors versus active investors, right? If you are a believer in the 10,000 hour rule, it takes you 10,000 hours to be an expert, right? Mike, you dedicated decades of your life to urologic oncology, right? And you put in the time to become an expert. Well, in real estate, you know, a guy like you who let's say says, hey, I think real estate's really cool. Great. Do I want to be a direct investor? Maybe. If that gets you fired up every day to wake up and go figure out how to do it, but you got to put in your hours. Just like you did, you know, through your fellowship and residency and med school and college and all of the hundreds of patients you worked with for many years. So I think that's why most people choose, or my recommendation is if you're going to be a direct investor, you just have to understand you don't have your hours yet. At, at Reliant, and it's a great example, we have 260 employees that all we do is self storage every day and we still screw it up all the time. And, and that's the piece where, you know, when people are investing passively, they're betting that a group like us isn't going to make that catastrophic error, right? They're not going to cut through ureter because they know where it is. They've seen it 1800 times. So I think that's just another mindset of people listening, right? I, I Physicians are a great example. You guys are smart, really successful people. And they're like, well, I can do this. Yep. You can. It's just, do you want to spend your time becoming an expert in that asset class? If not, my recommendation always, and this is how I think, is I don't want to learn how to invest in, you know, industrial or triple net, but I'll I want to go find the, the people who do, and I'm happy to share the profits with them because they're going to make less mistakes than I will. Does that make sense? That's great. No, it makes absolute sense because it's it's like saying if. If I want to go do it myself, I'm kind of stepping back into the role of I just graduated from college and now I'm going to medical school. Yep. And 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 understanding that that's where you are in the process. And that versus the guy who's done a thousand surgeries. You know, not that you can't get there, but you're going to make some mistakes along the way and it's going to be a lot more work. That's what med school and residency were, were a lot of work. And you, and you, in the case, kind of putting it back to real estate, you'll make more money if you don't partner with us, right? You're sharing profits with us. Assuming you do a great job, there's more upside for you. The question becomes, Mike, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 43. I only have so many more 10,000 hour blocks in my life, <laughs> right? And it's, what do I want to spend that time on? Is it becoming a self-storage operator? If that gets you fired up and wake to wake up out of bed and run away, okay. But, you know, if that's not what you want to do, then that's how I think about it, right? Is 
it, it's just time. That's, that's all we really have in our lives. And it's where you want to spend it. That's awesome. All right. So I'm going to wrap up the first half of our conversation with Chris here. Now, um, this has been awesome insight into the world of how to invest what I'd like to do is we're going to come back for the second half of this conversation, our next episode, and dive in a bit more into self-storage and what that means and that whole business operation as an asset class. So thank you and join us for the second half of our discussion. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional, and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.